We're glad that you're with us today. We're glad that you've chosen to come online and be a part of our worship service. We live in a world that has been changed by the pandemic and the church has not been spared from that challenges. Yet, as Christians, we're called to stay the course and continue the work and the mission that we're called to. Our scripture this morning comes from the epistle of James, the first chapter, verses 17 through 27. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he will brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creation. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and wickedness and receive with meekness implanted word, which is able to save your word, your soul. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself going away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. If any among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. May God add his blessing to his holy word. The book of James is somewhat of an unusual epistle. Many scholars believe that this was written somewhere between 46 and 49 AD, possibly making it the first book of the New Testament that was actually written. James is believed to be the brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. They had the same mother, but Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit. James and the rest of Jesus' brothers and sisters, Joseph was their father. While most of the epistle writers focus on the grace of our Lord, James fully understands that. But he believes and expresses that because we have been given this grace so freely by God, that our actions should show the love of God and the thankfulness we have for what he does for us. We express our love for the Lord and what we do. Martin Luther had a great deal of trouble with this writing. And because James called for action, Martin Luther called this epistle an epistle of straw. James never questioned that we were saved by grace. Having doubted his older brother and who he was as Jesus lived upon this earth, once Jesus had died and was resurrected, he appeared to James. And James then believed and served him until he was martyred. So he knew fully what the cross meant. He knew our salvation and the grace of God. James became a pillar of the early church in Jerusalem. He was known there as James the Just, and also because of his strong prayer life, he was called Camel Knees. James, it is said, spent so much time on his knees in prayer that his knees became calloused and hardened and looked like those of a camel. So we can see the change that came across this brother of the Lord as he accepted who Jesus was and served him faithfully. And I can imagine that the same older brother who played in the same carpenter shop that James grew up in, he struggled to realize that this was the one who was with God when he created the earth. 
And yet, he served him in the latter of his life without reservation, faithfully. In our scripture today, James begins by telling us about the goodness of God. A God who doesn't tempt us to do evil, but who instead brings good blessings upon us. These are the gifts that are given to us, and they're given to us not in light of this world, but in the light of eternity. They'll shape our lives and they'll help us to build a relationship with God and draw us closer. In a world of change, James tells us that God is constant. His love for us is never changing, but continuous. It's not based on what we do or what we fail to do. His love is based on who he is, a God who created us and who is proud of us and who loves us. His promises to us, James says, are secure. His guidance and his direction for our life doesn't change either. We can know who God is and we can be secure that he is the one who watches over us and who loves us. His direction and his protection blesses us and we are able to see his goodness and his strength and they live in us and we are in his hands, guided by him, protected by him. Our God is the same today as he was yesterday and he'll be the same tomorrow and every day for the rest of our lives. And we can live our life in faith and in confidence, believing in that. But having said those things, James also says that the theme of this writing is to say that it's good to know who God is. It's good to know about him. But if we don't serve the Lord, then we just simply have not done what God gave us this knowledge to do. We need to apply what we read and what we believe. The world needs to see us being a Christian because it has changed our life. We need to ask ourselves a question. What is it that my faith leads me to do? The messages that we read and hear are given to us to teach us, but also to inspire us to do things that God would call us to do, to give us courage and strength to be about those things. And we must realize that until we apply what we have learned, we have not produced anything. It's taught us, but it hasn't moved within us. And that's James' message to the church. James takes a moment and he tells us that we need to look in the mirror and we need to decide what is it we see. Most of us get up in the morning and we go and we look in the mirror and we need to brush our hair and we probably need to brush our teeth as well. We need to get the sleep out of our eyes and get ready to face the day. And we prepare ourselves to be ready for that. In James scripture today, he says you need to look at yourself spiritually like you're looking in the mirror and see yourself as God sees you. He tells us that if we open our hearts to the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit will show us the truth. It won't try and flatter us. It won't keep from us our shortcomings, but it will reveal to us whether or not we're doing the work of God, whether or not we're hearing his call and responding to it. It gives us an honest view of what our spiritual life is like. The Holy Spirit is working in our life and it will show us what we need to see. Maybe it'll be a little pain for us to see today, but better it be painful now then we'd be disappointed when we stand before the Lord because we haven't responded and haven't done the things that he's called us to do. 
James goes on and he gives to us another warning. He tells us to look at the spiritual mirror and decide the things that need to be corrected in our life, the things that we need to improve on, the things that God is calling to that we have not responded to him yet. James warns us. He said, the Holy Spirit brings it to you. And you see the things that you could be doing for God, the things you could be reaching out and touching the community with, things that would make a difference in person's lives. And you think about it and it touches your soul and you know that, yes, this is something that I could do. But James warns us, he says, we take a few days and we let this go on and the next thing we know, we start thinking about other things and this gets pushed aside. And he says, understand that the blessings that God intended to give to you by doing these things go away as well. Let me tell you that the joy and peace that God gives to those who will serve him, the joy and the blessings of seeing others helped and the kingdom of God built are great virtues and great blessings. If you're not about that, you're missing out something that you would enjoy a great deal. As I said early in the service, we live in a different day. The church has been damaged by the COVID. That's the church universal and our church here as well. There's been a great deal of casualties from it. And I speak to you in terms, not only of the deaths that have been caused by COVID, but the loss that the church has suffered as well. Those who have ceased to worship the Lord, those who have ceased to come before the Lord and be in his presence and to worship him. For many, Sunday morning has become nothing more than an extra day of vacation, a time to go enjoy what they want to do not the Lord's day. There are those who have taken the tithes and offerings that they used to bring before the Lord to do his work and they use them for their own pleasure, their own enjoyment. And yet, to be honest, these very same people still expect the Lord to be about blessing them and caring for them and seeing that they have what they need. It pains me as the pastor of this church to look at the work that is undone by our committees. The mission and the ministry that is not taking place because we don't have the people to undertake this work. God has not quit blessing us. He has still got his hand upon us. He has not stopped the work of building his people or building his kingdom and caring for his people. The call that God gives to us is still among us. We may have to change the way that we do some things, and that's quite possible. But the things that God is calling us to are still in place. We may need to do them differently, but we need to be doing them. We need to be about the work of our Father. I heard the story one time about a pastor who went into his study and wrote the sermon and he came out a little earlier than he normally did and his secretary looked at him and she asked him, is the sermon done yet? And he paused a moment and then he looked at her and he said, the sermon is written, but it hasn't even begun to be done yet. The work that we're called to do isn't complete yet. The work of our Lord is still given to us. I ask you to pray about what God is calling you to, about what he would have you serve in, about what you can do to build the kingdom of God and receive the blessings that he has for you. I ask you to Find the courage and strength through the Holy Spirit to be about that work. Not only for the work of the church, but for you as well. 
James then speaks about a pure and undefiled religion. He said some people call themselves religious, but they fail to show it in their life. He says that, you know, you get into a conversation with them and they're criticizing others or criticizing the work of the church. He says a pure and undefiled religion is to show the love of God to one another, to reach out and take the blessings that God has given you and to let them shine throughout the world, to see the goodness of our faith in action. We're to have a thankful heart that sees God's goodness to us and we can't keep it into ourselves, but we need to share it with the world. James goes and he says, what pleases God is to care for orphans and widows in trouble. Too often we think of working for God as something that we need to do that is of great magnitude or something that takes a long commitment. James says that what God would have you to do is whatever he puts in front of you. Whatever your eyes sees and whatever opportunities you see to make this world a better place, to share the goodness of God, to tell of the love of Jesus Christ, and to be involved where you can. As I said earlier, James was a leader in the church of Jerusalem, and that's where his action took place, and he served faithfully there until he was martyred. The church is still the great opportunity for a Christian to be involved and to serve in. It's God's will that we do that. I think James would like this story of St. Francis of Assisi. One day this great teacher invited a young monk to go with him into the village to preach. This young apprentice was thrilled because he couldn't imagine anything more exciting than going and hear this great teacher and preacher speaking in the village. So when they came to the village, the first thing he did was take him into the butcher shop. And they sat there and talked with the butcher for a few minutes. And he prayed with him and they went on. Next, they went to the cobbler and they had a little time with him and prayed and again went down the street. They visited a woman who had recently buried her husband and they consoled her and prayed for strength for her. And this went on and on after they stopped at a school and spoke with a teacher and found out how the school was doing and what needs they had. And the next thing you know, it was on into the afternoon. And then Francis told his young disciple that it was time that they returned to the abbey. And the young disciple said, I don't understand. You told me that we were coming to the village to preach and we haven't preached a single sermon yet. And Francis asked him, haven't we? People have watched us. People have listened to us. They've responded to every word that was spoken and every deed that we did. We've done what we came to do. Everything we did today was a sermon. We preached all day. That reminds me that it was Francis of Assisi who once said, preach without ceasing. And if you have to, use words. All that we do for the Lord is a sermon. And you will preach them to people that I will never see and will never see me. They'll never hear the word of God in a message, but they'll see it through your life. And it can change them and lead them to the Lord. We're reminded of what Jesus said. He said, what you have done for one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done for me. What would he call you to do? What opportunities has he placed in front of you? For James, the worship that takes place on Sunday leads us to be active on Monday morning and through the rest of the week. For our faith is not about how much we know. Instead, it's about what our faith leads us to do and to be about. May we be found faithful.
Let us pray. Father, we bow before you this morning. We ask your blessings. We ask for your guidance. And we ask for your strength. That we may reach out and build your kingdom one person at a time. That we may reach out with the goodness and the grace of God, hearing your call and responding that your kingdom may be better and stronger because we heard your voice and we came and we did as you ask. You don't ask great magnitudes of things for us to do, just that we be faithful for what you put in front of us. May we be found that way. These things we ask in your holy name. Amen. <laughs>